Oh, wow. That, that is a cranking song right there. Uh, my name's Marcel, and this is my beautiful wife, Tia Turner. We get the awesome privilege of overseeing the Atlanta church, but also being, uh, you know, leaders of the bold campus ministry. Uh, this, is, this is quite the light tonight. Uh, I haven't seen more fired up disciples in my 17 years of discipleship. You know, the title of our lesson tonight is Be the Light. And I, I've been so grateful for the preaching so far. Matt has preached a few lessons, and it's all about being the light. Not doing the light, pretending to be the light. Just, just be the light. And we're going to open up, as Isaac said, you're going to hear this all weekend, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. And I want to encourage you with something. Nobody in this room... It's a command. Doubt that God loves you. Like, it is, it is, it is one of those impossibilities. Take it off the table. Like, no, no more beliefs like I don't matter. Like, no more of that. You know why? Because you're here tonight. And you're bold. And you're awesome. And you're chosen. And as we've already sang, it's already been spoken. <laughs> Verse 14, it says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in Tampa, in Gainesville, in Miami, in Atlanta, in Knoxville, in Baton Rouge, in New Delhi, all of India, in all of Trinidad, in all the for all nations. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We're no longer fearful to show our actions because of other people's reactions. You're going to be persecuted. Do it like Austin. Lay on the ground and smile. <laughs> In 2007, I was in a world of hurt. And one random night, someone decided to be the light. I was suicidal, depressed, and had all the excuses in the world. And I didn't make any efforts. I just wanted the world to hand it to me. And when it wasn't, I felt really down about myself. So I tried to steal what I felt belonged to me due to the bitterness of a lack of acceptance of the allowance of God in my life. I learned a lesson through depression. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't have found him. But if I stayed in it, I would have lost him. The youth. The campus. It's depressed. A lot of sad people in the world. But not us. We are the light. When I was met, I wanted to forget. Because I was filled with regret. And so I was reached out to. And the brother called me not one time, not twice, not three times, but 30 times before I answered. How many times do you call? I was weeping. I finally answered it. And you know what the first event I went to in my life in the kingdom? Campus devotional. And you know who was there? Ricky and Co. <laughs> Mike Patterson. So many others. There's about 60 people in that room. It was the most joyful experience I had ever had up until that moment. And I looked at everybody and I just crossed my arms and leaned on the wall. Because I wasn't sure what was going on. 
the brothers reached out to me. They loved me. They cherished me. They carried me. They preached to me. They laid me out, and they prayed it out. It never stopped. They studied the Bible with me for like a month and a half. I got baptized into the campus ministry March 18th of 2007. Be the light. Stop judging people by mere appearance. Be the light. Because as of right now, I'm looking at the brightest lights I've ever seen. Other than my wife's smile. We're just going to preach three simple points. Point number one, in your campus ministry, devos light up your campus. What you saw tonight, I want to inspire the campus minister and the evangelists to imitate it. Because these kids, they're looking for that. They're looking for something that will stir their emotions so they can get in motion. They need their hearts to be set free. So it's important that our devos light up our campuses. John 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of only the kingdom. Who takes away the sin of only the international Christian church. Who takes away the sin of the entire world. Devos need to meet the needs of students on your campus. It is to be so worshipful that people need to walk by. If you're doing devos in, your, in, your, in classrooms, I want to encourage you, they're in classrooms all day. Devos are dead in classrooms, in my opinion. Got to bring it out in public. Do it in the student unions. Do it on the yards. Do it in front of the student unions. Do it all around the student unions. Do it around a fountain. Because you are the mountain. And it's not meant to be hidden in a room. It's meant to go boom, boom, and consume and light up your campuses. The singing. There needs to be worshipful singing. There needs to be power and praise that makes the roof raise. We need our campuses to grow from 30 to 300 overnight right here, right now. And it's up to you guys to be the light on your campuses through your devotionals. It's potentially the moment of your week where the most visitors come to. The most visitors, guys, at our campus devos, there's usually about 80 to 100 people. And the roof comes off. And when visiting disciples come from different churches, they go, oh my gosh, what is this? Why? It's on campus. It's social. It's fun. The most important part of Devos is that you worship God with all of your hearts. Light up your campus through your Devos. Tia is going to give you some practicals. worship tonight. It was awesome. And, you know, I have one practical, but I wanted to share. So Marcel and I moved to Atlanta about two years ago. Actually, it was two years last month. And if you've ever been to Miami, and then you've, and then you've gone to Atlanta, what you'll find, it's, a, it's like a completely different country, right? It's Latin America and then the United States. Like, that is Atlanta. So, one of my favorite scriptures is in 1 Corinthians 9 and 19. And this practical is very simple, but the scripture is what I'll read first. It says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. In verse 22, it says, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. And it's very simple. We must learn the needs of the students on our campus. We must learn the needs. In Miami, the need was Latin music. The need was a lot of food. 
and we would do a shorter lesson and then have a dance party. Literally every single devotional was either a dance lesson or a dance party after the preaching. And people probably thought, well, that's weird. That's not how we normally do things in the kingdom. But we did it not because we wanted to, but because we needed to make ourselves a slave to win the culture of Miami. We moved to Atlanta, and you know the, the hands raised worship? I grew up in the kingdom. I didn't grow up with that. So I always associated that with false worship, honestly. That, that is what I grew up thinking. Oh, these people are raising their hands on Sunday mornings, but what did they do Saturday night? That's how I felt about it. So moving to Atlanta, we would invite people to Devo, and they're like, Devo? Devo. I mean, did you know what a Devo was? Nobody, I've never heard that word other than inside the kingdom, but they were disturbed even by the word. We changed it to worship night. And we invite people on campus, oh, why don't you come to our worship night? Oh, worship night, I love worship nights. You don't know what you're getting yourself into, but you already love it because it's relatable. And so we had to learn the needs of our students. They needed heart-moving worship. They needed to come in to a campus devotional and not feel awkward and like they couldn't raise their hands without people giving them weird looks because honestly, sometimes that's what I did, right? And maybe you can relate. And so I share this scripture because as disciples, as campus students, we are slaves. We're slaves to Christ, you know, and he's awesome, but we're slaves to everyone on our campus because the goal is Jesus's goal to win as many as possible. You know, I, I wanted to share one more thing and that's just to not be afraid to make devos relatable. Just don't be afraid to make it relatable. Um, Marcel, he shared with me earlier in the year, babe, I think I want to start doing worshipful hand-raising songs at devotional in church. And I was like, no, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. This is a horrible idea. What's everyone going to think? People are going to come visit Atlanta and be like, they have lost their minds. But really, I was afraid to make it too relatable because I felt like, well, if it's, if it's relatable, then people will think that they can just sin it up and come to our devotionals. Well, if people are gonna send it up and come to Devo, they're gonna do it whether we raise our hands in worship or not. So we might as well draw them in with the music and then slap them across the face with the word of God because I promise you, they've never heard anything like what they hear when the songs are done and the Bible is opened. I, I think about Paul and, you know, we love, if you're a woman, I'm sure you love Lydia in the Bible. She's a prominent woman who was converted in Acts 16. But what's really cool is Paul met her at a place of prayer. It wasn't a place where disciples were praying. It was a place where religious people were praying. He met her. He preached the word and converted her entire family. And we know about it thousands of years later because he wasn't afraid to meet the religious where they were at. And so I changed the scripture a little bit. To win the southern religious people, I became like a southern religious person. Can I get an amen? amen. To win them, and we've won them because the scriptures always work. And I want to encourage you guys with something. There's a greater purpose. There's a greater purpose to why we do what we do. It's not about kingdom culture. You don't want to get so stuck in kingdom culture that you're willing to change, and then your ministry never grows, and you baptize the same kinds of people year after year, week after week. If you want to evangelize the world, you've got to make it about a culture that saves the world. Uh, it, it can be anything. Uh, Luke actually used to lead the Phoenix Church. And uh, I was there. And I was a part of the campus ministry. And I used to jump in trash cans to share my faith. Luke would try to cool me down a little bit. And uh, he said, bro, let's do something fun for Devo. Out of the box. What could we do? And I'm like, dude, we could do skits. He's like, yeah. What's our skit? The Godfather. I said, bro, you can be the godfather, and I'll be the guy he smacks. 
So in the middle of Devo, we do all these skits, just out of the box. Like, just, nobody else does that, and we're just, let's do something different. He sits me down in a chair, and we're like, acting like we're arguing, and he goes, you can act like a man, and smacks me across the face. I fall on the ground like, ow. We worship God. That's one of the fastest growing campus ministries I had ever seen. Because the Devos were a light. People loved to go to the Devos. I want to give a challenge to the church leaders and the campus minister. Do something different. If your campus hasn't exploded in growth, change your Devos. Do something crazy. If you need to go pay for pizza, then go pay for pizza. If you need to just go out and have an all-night prayer, whatever it is that your Devo needs, do something crazy, and it'll be amazing. Amen? Amen. Point number two, this is a challenge. You guys ready for a little challenge? Leaders light up your campus. John 1, verse 40, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard... No, no, I'm sorry. We're actually switching the point. Let me just reverse real fast. Point number two is, uh, yes, actually, no, I'm kidding. Leaders light up your campus. Was one of those two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Anybody want a nickname from Jesus? Now right here, who's the one that's meeting all these leaders? Jesus. Who's the one that converted all the disciples? The disciples, but who raised up the leaders? Jesus. Evangelists and women's ministry leaders that have a church that's a little bit smaller than 500. I want to encourage you, this is where the evangelists come from. This is where the women's ministry leaders come from. And you're like, hey, I want my 12. Bruh. There's like 12,000 young men that are waiting to follow you. But you're never on campus. You're a light to your bedroom doing Excel sheets. Yeah, you need to pray and read your word. But there's a 17-year-old waiting for you to say, follow me. One of the most inspirational leaders in the Sages World sector is Jacob Wessels. And right next to him is Hannah Wessels. You know how old Jacob was when he got baptized? 18. Do you know when I started discipling Jacob when he was 18 years old? How old are you now, Jacob? 28 years old. And what's going to happen on Sunday? As an evangelist in God's kingdom... Alex, how old were you when you got baptized? How old are you now? When did you get appointed an evangelist? How old were you? 23? (laughs) Zach Dryden, how old were you when you got baptized? How old are you now? When did you get appointed? Who appointed you? Who appointed you? Who's appointing you? Hannah, who's appointing you? Who's appointed your wife? Who appointed your wife? Here's the point. Evangelists need to appoint evangelists. Women's ministry leaders need to appoint women's ministry leaders. I think it's hard to go off onto campus for leaders to be the light because you lose more hair and you go more gray and your contra goes a little down for like five years and everybody thinks oh all he can do is lead campus ministry Amen. well that's all you need yeah. if you can lead a campus ministry you can lead singles yeah. you can lead marrieds you can lead widows but if you don't lead the campus 20 years down the road there's going to be no appointed evangelists and no appointed women's ministry leaders there'll be a churches that have been around for five to ten years and they're still at a campus that's 30 or less Because it's the leader that needs to get on that campus. And then you get in that campus, and they need to meet a crazy 18-year-old like Jacob and say, I'm going to start discipling you, bro. And he's going to say, yeah! (laughs) 
And then 10 years down the road, preach the word. So the charge here is simple. Evangelists and women's ministry leaders, take 2024 and choose three men that are in your campus ministry to appoint in 2027. If you're an evangelist, you need to choose three men today in your campus ministry that you will appoint in 2027. And then those evangelists need to choose in 2027 three people they're going to appoint in 2030. Disciples make disciples who make disciples. Evangelists make evangelists who make evangelists. And you know where you're going to find your evangelists? On campus. Tia's going to share. two practicals and I think the woman will be able to relate a lot with this but my first practical is go on campus with an intention and this point is very important because it says leaders we light up our campuses right and I think that it's very easy when you get put in a role of a leader there's something about that word a leader oh I'm a leader and we start thinking that we don't have to do what we did to get us to be a leader right and then we stop we stop doing it. And I think it's very natural. It's very normal, but it's not acceptable to God. So we have to go on, on campus with an intention. And uh, something my husband brought up to me in the beginning of the semester is you're the change. Like what you want to see change in your woman's ministry, that is who you are and that's who you need to be. So go on campus, right? Make it happen. And I was fired up because I love a challenge. And so I had to realize this past semester that I'm going to be the only one who can change what needs to change in my campus ministry. And so this is encouraging because it means whatever my ministry is lacking and whatever your ministry is lacking as a leader and all of you are leaders, right? Not just those who are appointed. Every single one of you is a leader because if you're a disciple, you're a leader. So if there's a crack in your campus ministry, if you feel like, oh, we need more, I don't know, Indians in our campus ministry in uh, Orlando, right? I don't know how that's going, but maybe it's going awesome. But maybe you need more. Maybe you need more. You don't get critical. You don't sit at home and think about all the reasons why you only have a whole bunch of one race and no Indians. You go on campus and you figure out how to convert Indian woman, or if you're a man, Indian men, right? And so this was encouraging because for me, this uh, past semester, actually, I feel like God was pressing on my heart since we moved to the South. Okay, the South is awesome. The South is not super diverse, right? It's very white and it's very black. You, you got pretty much half and half. KSU is mostly white, and then it's actually a pretty diverse campus, but it's half white, a little more than half, and then there's some other races sprinkled in, right? And so I realized, well, the charge that God has given us is to evangelize the Southeast. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to the Southeast, but you've got Alabama, you've got Mississippi, you've got these places, and y you know, you, you need a certain kind of person to evangelize these places. And so I made a decision at the beginning of the year. I said, you know what? I'm going to find me a Southern Belle who's going to go and plant a church in Tennessee, and I'm going to convert her. And she's going to have blonde hair and blue eyes. I don't know. I just, that was on my heart. I felt like God put that on my heart. So I made that decision. And so we were praying as a leadership, praying, 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 what can we do to kick off the semester? And we decided to do a Barbie night. Women like Barbie, right? It's very relatable. So we do this Barbie night, and Priscilla and I were out sharing our faith for the Barbie night, and I stopped this girl. She was coming in the opposite direction. I said, hey, and she had a big tattoo on her arm. I said, what's that about? And she shared a little bit with me, and we started talking, and she was like, yeah, I'm the only one in my family to go to college. I want to do great things. I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm a cheerleader, blah, blah, blah. I said, wow. And so we exchanged numbers. I invited her to Barbie night, and I walked away, and I said to Priscilla, I said, I'm going to convert that girl. She's going to be a disciple. And what's incredible is she did come to Barbie night. She brought friends, and uh, just one and a half months later, Rachel was baptized, and she's here tonight. And I don't know where 
she is, but you can't miss her. <laughs> She's exactly what I prayed for. And you know, here's what's even cooler is that through Rachel, Madeline was baptized. She's awesome. She's a gymnast at KSU. Madeline was baptized. She's also from a small town in Georgia. Kalia was baptized. Samira was baptized as a part of that Bible talk, and that was just in two and a half months. The impact that one person can make because I made the decision that I'm going to be the change. What was amazing um, about the Barbie night as well is we had 15 women in the campus at the time and God allowed there to be 72 in attendance, which is something we had never seen before. So I wanted to share that just in case you feel a little bit intimidated. What does that mean? How can I do this? Maybe you feel like you don't have the time. You absolutely have the time because you're the only one who can change what needs to change in your campus. I looked at Marcel because I had a second practical, but I didn't know if I was going for too long. So I'm going to share it. He said, he gave me the head nod. Here's the second practical. Look for opportunities to raise up leaders with the time you have. And this is specifically for the campus ministers who are sisters or for the women's ministry leaders. Look for opportunities to raise up leaders with the time you have. Here's the deal. No time is no excuse. It's not an excuse. We can't use that as an excuse anymore. So I want to share with you John 1 for the sisters. In John 1, 38 to 39, it says, turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you will see. And, you know, I think sometimes as women in particular, we can feel like, what do you want? I have so much to do. I have to do laundry. I have to cook. I have to clean. I have a child. I have a husband who I also have to take care of. I have a lot to do, you know? And we feel like, what do you want? And I love Jesus' response because he says, come and see. And it says they spent the day with Jesus. And, you know, I, I give this practical because if we make the most of every opportunity to raise up leaders by having them spend the day with us, we will raise up and we will equip leaders all throughout our campuses. And, and something I think is important as well is we've got to stop being afraid to inconvenience the women in our ministries. Here's the deal. If I disciple you, you need to arrange your schedule so that it fits with my schedule because you're being trained. And I think we've got to be unapologetic. Helen taught me that. I'm very grateful for Helen um, because I used to be afraid to call people to change their schedules. And she said, no, like you are training them. Their schedule needs to coincide with yours. But again, we've got to be afraid to stop inconveniencing people because really we end up inconveniencing Jesus by failing to raise up leaders. And I just want to share to inspire you some of the women who uh, have raised up as leaders because they spent the day with me. Hannah Wessel, she was the first nanny of Selah. Selah was literally like a month old. And um, we had a lot of fun times during that time in Gainesville. But she, like Marcel shared, is going to be appointed on Sunday. Juliana Arias, who leads the church in Lima, Peru, she helped with Sela for about three years. And she was over the house every day. She was a full-time student. She had an internship with the diabetes clinic. And she was studying pre-med. And she still figured it out. And now the fruit that that church has produced is miraculous. I think of Deborah Gonzalez, <laughs> who you guys love. Um, you know, Deborah's incredible. She's really the fruit of so many women, uh, specifically in the sages. But Helen gave me the privilege of discipling her, and she helped around the house. She spent many days with me, and now she's an incredible women's ministry leader. And then, of course, Melanie and Gunjo who lives with Marcel and I. She and her husband live with Marcel and I. They were appointed in Miami. But that all started because she spent the day with me. She spent many days with me, not just one. But she spent the years with me every day. And so, again, my practical is very simple. Look for opportunities to raise up leaders with the time you have. Excellent. That was excellent.
If you want to become an incredibly bold and audacious and like an awesome women's ministry leader, babysit a church leader's child. <laughs> Bruh. I'm going to do something daring because we're, we're the Bold Campus Ministry. We have any brothers in the house? Yeah. Do you have any brothers that want to let go of all your insecurities? Yeah. Right. If you don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. Because not everybody's this role. But a lot of you are. I would like for the men to stand up that desire to be an evangelist within the next three years. Just stand up. Wait, wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, evangelism, 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 evang
Ashton gets met, gets baptized, brings his friend Austin, who also squats like that. And Austin gets baptized. Austin and Ashton have a discipler in the powerlifting world. His name is Kyle. And Kyle gets baptized. But I'm sorry, Ashton, but Kyle powerlifts 600 pounds. That happens over and over again. All you got to do is say, hey, do you have any friends? Come follow me. Bring your friends. And you do that over and over and over and over. Instead of one baptism, you've got a ton of baptisms. We're not thinking singular anymore. We're thinking multitudes. No longer are we thinking predictions because we're not magicians. We're thinking who is getting baptized? And your mom, and your dad, and your brothers, and your cousins, and your aunts, and your uncles, and your brother's cousin's uncles. Everybody gets baptized. But you need to have the faith to not reach one, but to reach a ton. If it happened once, it can happen again. So whoever you're studying the Bible with right now, I want you to write down their name and ask them this question. Do you have any family members that would like to study the Bible? And if they say, well, I think so. What about any friends? Because friend groups that get baptized, they don't persecute each other anymore. Tia's going to share. So uh, I love this point. You light up your campus because that means every single one of us is a light. Every one of us makes an impact. And the scripture that Marcel shared is incredible because the first thing that happened is after Jesus, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm reading the wrong thing. Yes, okay. After Jesus found his disciples, they found others, right? So they were actually the ones finding people. And I think about the stories that Marcel shared, and there's a sister in our ministry. Her name is Jocelyn. <laughs> Jocelyn's incredible. She's awesome. So she was actually baptized last year at our Women's Day in Atlanta, and she brought with her a friend named Emily. And Emily was like in this relationship with this guy who was way too old. I'm not going to say how old he was. She, she was in this relationship. She didn't want to break it off. And she comes to Women's Day. She sees Jocelyn's baptism. They grew up together in the same town. They've known each other for years, middle school and high school. So Emily comes. She starts coming to church. She studies the Bible. One month later, Emily is baptized. And then... Here's what's amazing, is this year, at our Women's Day, Sam was baptized, and she was in the video you saw. She was the one who uh, gently discipled Nazareth on his pride and arrogance. But together, Emily and Jocelyn converted Sam. And that's the power of really believing that you are the light on your campus. It worked in the first century. Brothers brought brothers to Christ. Friends brought, brought friends to Christ. And so I thought about, well, what is it that makes disciples not do that? You know, I'm, I'm old. I just turned 33. All of my friends are old. You know, I feel really cool because all the campus women want to be my friend, which is awesome. But you need to reach out to your friends, right? Because now my friends are old and they have children. So I thought, well, what, why is it that people don't do that? And I think, at least for the sisters, maybe you can relate, but I think sometimes we get afraid, well, what's going to happen if I spend time with them? Am I going to go back to my sin? You know, or maybe they're going to ask me a question and I'm not going to know what to say. Duh, you have the Holy Spirit. Like, it says all throughout the scriptures, the Spirit will give you the words to speak. But we can't be afraid to make our best friends or ex-best friends, in some cases, into true family. We must understand that we are the light. And I, I love thinking about Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry is the most inspiring ministry because he actually did everything perfectly. 
none of us do that. But he did everything perfectly. And in his ministry, what was incredible is he constantly got invited to people's parties. I mean, you have to be really cool to constantly be invited to weddings, to parties. He was even invited to McDonald, you know, the, the Pharisee. He was even invited to those sorts of people's houses. And they didn't treat him very well, but they invited him, you know? And so I think, wow, this is the impact we need to have on our friends on campus. If we don't go to the weddings, who there is going to be the light? Who there is going to be the one to say, I can have fun without doing all the crazy stuff you guys are doing? Who's going to be there to share our faith? Now, I'm not saying go to parties. I want to make sure that nobody leaves here thinking that I'm telling you to go to a party. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying flirt to convert. I'm not saying any of those things. What I'm saying is that in your friend group, don't abandon those people. Make them into true family because this is what worked in the first century and this is what will work today. You are the light on your campus. Excellent. So at this point, I would like for all of you guys to write down one thing about this third point. Write down one thing you're really good at if you're a student on campus and go find something on campus that helps you be a light in that area. For instance, if you're good at chess, go join the chess club. Like literally do that and you go, oh, I don't have any time. Make time. Because your relationships show people discipleship. Yeah. I think many disciples, we feel unsocial. We're antisocial. So we forget most of people on campus are social. So when we share our faith, we're like, do you want to come to Devo? They're like, no, weirdo. <laughs> Why don't they ever want to come to Devo with me? Because you're not really connected. You're kind of rejected. Which is fine, but you got to get involved. you got to get in so that way people can be saved from their sin. I love the example of uh, our sister Maddie, and she's a gymnast. She wants to be in the Olympics. Yeah. I love it. And Rachel's a cheerleader, and we got all these cool. Nazareth is an actor on campus, and, and they're all connected. They're not rejecting those groups because they need Jesus. And their only example of Jesus would be you. I think sometimes we get a little intimidated because we feel like we're not going to be righteous enough. But you will be. Just be the light. So go ahead. Go on your campus. Choose that one thing you're good at. Find a social interaction you could be a part of consistently for an entire semester and make a decision to baptize somebody. We could be the light. Just remember this. In 2007, a disciple decided to be a light to me. And that light kept on shining. And because he never gave up, 30 calls later, the first event I went to was a campus devotional. And I was 20 years old when I got baptized. I'm 36 now. 37. <laughs> and did you know I've never left the campus ministry? <laughs> like, I'm going to be 80 years old being in campus ministry. I'm going I'm to be 85 years old. I'm going to take one of these young guys, like, hey, this is John. He wants to be an evangelist in the kingdom of God. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to have a heart attack appointing evangelists. But when that time comes, I want all of us to be there. All of us on campus. Now, I'm not saying be a weirdo, like 85 years old on campus walking around. What I'm saying is always have a heart for this young group you guys are. Remember, we just had a, over 100 people stand up saying, here am I, send me. And it's time for us to go out there and be sent. And let's get every campus ministry to be the light. Here's my challenge for 2024. Every campus surpasses 50. Every campus surpasses 50. And, 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 and some of the smaller churches, you're like, well, it's hard. Just be the light. You'll do it. Let's go out there. Let's change the world. We're going to close out with one response and then a final song called Lion. Let's give it up for Jacob and Hannah Wessels.